All right, let me uh, tell you what we're going to do today. I'm going to take about uh, 20, 25 minutes, so about a third of the class, to complete my discussion of uh, uh, questions related to gender and uh, women in Indian society, and then move to the next, next uh, segment, which is uh, week eight, and that's uh, you know, popular and public culture in South Asia, uh, where the bulk of the discussion will be on cinema. And uh, I just want to remind you uh, that there is a film that you're supposed to see for this class called Divar. Has anybody seen it already? Uh, you're able to access it, no problem? OK, I just want to make sure that you're able to access it. So you should definitely have seen the film before you come to class on Thursday, because I will be having a discussion of uh, particular portions and segments of the film. Uh, there will be a general discussion of Indian cinema, but uh, as with the texts, at some point, uh, the arguments make more sense if you can look at it in relationship to a particular work rather than simply in a generic sense. Okay, so that's going to be what we're going to be doing over the course of uh, this particular week. Uh, but as I said, you know, the section on popular and uh, public culture will be mainly on cinema, but not restricted to it. I mean, I want to look at the notion of public space in a larger, larger sense as well. Before we do that, let me wrap up my discussion about uh, women. And uh, I, I want to remind you what we had been talking about uh, in uh, the previous week. What we'd been talking about, particularly in the last lecture, was uh, the question of dowry. Uh, so we had a, I had a rather extensive uh, discussion about that with you. And uh, we haven't you know, really exhausted the subject, but I think I've said as much as I need to say about this particular issue. Uh, and what I want to uh, uh, do today, uh, first of all, is begin with uh, what is called the Shah Bano case. Um, and in order to do that, uh, I think that there are a couple of other things that I have to set up first. One is that um, after India acquired independence in 1947, and the Constitution came into effect in late 1949, early 1950, you remember that there was this thing called the Constituent Assembly. I've spoken to you about it a number of times, and what, what the Constituent Assembly was charged with doing was drafting a constitution for the new Republic of India. Uh, the person who was the head of the drafting committee was uh, B.R. Ambedkar, um, and I've spoken to you about Ambedkar as well, and the differences that he had with somebody like Gandhi back in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, uh, uh, an issue that comes up before the Constituent Assembly, um, uh, is an issue that has not really disappeared down to the present day. And that is the issue of whether everybody in the country should be subjected to the same civil laws. Okay? Um, and, and you have to make a clear distinction between criminal laws or legislation pertaining to the criminal procedure code, because as in the US, for example, you have a code that governs uh, issues having to do with crime. Okay, how do you define a crime? What constitutes a crime? Uh, so forth and so on. Um, uh, how is, for example, a state to adjudicate on the issue of homosexuality? Now you might say that, well, it's, there's nothing left to adjudicate. You might say that, hypothetically, we know that that's not true. But there are all kinds of issues. Uh, and they have to do with not simply criminal matters, but they have to do with matters related to inheritance, marriage, adoption, right? How does a state legislate on these issues? And so you have to make a distinction between, between that portion of the legislation which has to do with criminal matters and that portion of the legislation which has to do with civil matters. Okay? And in the case of criminal matters, there is a common set of procedures. Whether you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, makes no difference, obviously. Okay? However, this, the Indian Republic reached a decision and the antecedents of this decision go back to the 18th century. They go back to the time when the British were in India. And the British came to the conclusion that there were separate laws that had governed the lives of Muslims and laws that had governed the lives of Hindus okay, in matters such as marriage, okay, adoption, inheritance, property rights, a huge issue, property rights. So for example, do daughters inherit property as much as sons do? Is Muslim law different on this issue than Hindu law? 
Okay? And we're not going to go into the question of whether it is or is not different. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to articulate for you a position, a question that comes up in the constituent assembly debates, and that question was, all right, for all criminal matters, there's going to be a common set of procedures which are going to apply to everybody. And that's the law of the land. But when it comes to matters such as property rights, marriage, what constitutes a marriage, how do you, how do you differentiate a Hindu marriage between, from a, Hindu, a Muslim marriage from a Hindu marriage or a Hindu marriage from a Sikh marriage, right? What are the rights of the children in divorce, for example? Okay? There, the argument was that what we're going to do is we're going to have a separate civil law for the Hindus and the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Jains and so on. Okay? That was a position adopted by the Constituent Assembly. And in effect, that position remains down to the present day. Right? You have to remember that in order for you to understand something like the Shabano case. Now, when I say that, let me give you a concrete instance, illustration of what that would mean before we move to this particular case. So, uh, for example, adoption. Uh, in 1956, they passed the Hindu Adoption Act. Okay? And so this is six years after, because the Constituent Assembly, remember, it's like the Constitution of America. You know, if those of you are familiar with the U.S. Constitution, you know it's a minuscule document. I mean, it's really small, right? Because the Constitution articulates the largest principles, and then it's a matter for the courts or for the other branches of government, the legislative branch, to fill in the details. And that's what is really done. Right? So similarly, of course, the Constitution of India cannot tell you in great detail what are the laws governing adoption of Hindus. Okay? Right? Um, and this is where the legislation comes in. So in 1956, you have a legislation. It's called the Hindu Adoption Act or the Hindu Succession Act. And it basically stipulates the grounds under which Hindus can adopt and what happens when a child is adopted to a Hindu family. Okay? Now, the, the legislation tells you very clearly that this, the title of the legislation, Hindu Adoption Act, Hindu Succession Act, that this pertains only to Hindus in India. So if you were a Muslim child, right, and you had been abandoned, or your parents had been killed, and you had become an orphan, and you had been placed in an orphanage, right, and you were then adopted by a Muslim couple, let's say, then that adoption would not fall under the Hindu Adoption Act. It would fall under the Indian Adoption Act, which applies to all communities other than Hindus. And that would apply to Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, Christians, Jews, whatever the case may be. Okay? That's, what we're, that's roughly the distinction that we're making over here. Okay? Now, if you keep that in mind, let's move to the Shah Bano case. What is the Shah Bano case? So Shah Bano was... In, in the late 1970s, a woman, a Muslim woman, 62 years of age, mother of five children, comes from central India, and her case is eventually going to go to the courts. Why? She gets divorced by her husband in 1976. Okay? And she tries to get maintenance, which is the word that is used in Indian English. Uh, if you had to translate it into American English, uh, you would say alimony. Okay? That's what maintenance really means. Right? Uh, there are some technical differences which we need not really get into, but the equivalent here would be alimony. So she gets divorced by her husband. The marriages and divorces of Muslims are governed by a separate piece of legislation. Just like for adoption, they're governed by a separate piece of legislation. Okay? And what this piece of legislation in effect says that when a Muslim woman gets divorced in India by her husband, by her Muslim husband, the case will not go to the normal courts. It will go to a Sharia court. It will go to a Sharia court. Okay? And that court will make the adjudication. If there is a dispute between the husband and the wife, and the dispute could be over the children, it could be over property, it could be over maintenance, so forth and so on, right? Now, Muslim personal law, so this is what it's called. When, when, a Mus when you're looking at matters related to property, rights, inheritance, <coughs> adoption, divorce, all of that, that's called Muslim personal law. It all forms under the jurisdiction of Muslim personal law. 
Muslim personal law does not require ongoing maintenance. Okay, that's what the law says in India, Muslim personal law, that if a woman gets divorced by her husband, her husband divorces her, okay, the husband is not required to give her maintenance or a monthly amount, okay. Why is he not required to do that? In part because remember, and now you have to go back to the discussion of last week, remember I told you about this thing called meher? Meher is the amount of money that is set aside okay at the time of a marriage but there may be marriages where the meher may be very very small or non-existent now whatever the technicalities in the shabano case what we're saying is that shabano is divorced by her husband she's a muslim woman okay and the muslim personal law says that she is not entitled to get a monthly maintenance or alimony from her husband so she goes to the regular courts she goes to the regular courts Okay, and this is where the dispute is now going to occur. What does she ask the regular courts? She says to the regular courts that this is a secular country. Okay, this is a secular country. I should be given a certain amount of maintenance by my husband. Muslim personal law does not allow that. I want you. She's telling the Supreme Court this, by the way, because eventually it's going to go up to the Supreme Court. She's telling the court, I want you to overrule the Muslim personal law in my case and award a, a certain amount of maintenance per month. Right? That's what she's saying. The Supreme Court agrees to do that. And this is where the huge furor is now going to take place because you can imagine what's going to happen right? when the Supreme Court agrees to do that. Right? The Muslim mullahs, the Qazis, all of them are going to come into the debate. And they're going to say, so in fact, actually the best way to put it is that you have what is called a Muslim, all India, all India Muslim personal law board. That's what it's called. Okay? So what, in other words, what this group, what this organization does is it basically looks at the status of Muslim personal law. And the people who are sitting on the all India Muslim personal board are people who are obviously senior Muslim clerics, intellectuals, policy makers, whatever the case may be, okay? Right? And these are the people who decide what will be the personal law affecting Muslims, right? Now the All India Muslim Personal Board intervened into the debate at this point and said, this is a violation of Muslim personal law. This is a violation of the long held stipulation that the Constitution of India makes a distinction between criminal matters and civil matters and says very clearly okay, that in civil matters the laws pertaining to Muslims shall be decided only by Muslims, not by some entity called the Supreme Court of India. Okay? So this is going to become known as a Shah Bano case because essentially the court rules that she can get ongoing maintenance and this is what the court said. I'm just going to quote a couple of lines. The court says that, quote, a common civil code, civil code, right? Because we're talking about civil matters, not criminal matters. There, there's, not, there's no dispute. A common civil code will help the cause of national integration by removing disparate loyalties and laws which have conflicting ideologies. Okay? So what the Supreme Court is saying is that actually what the Muslim personal law is doing is it creates divided loyalties in Muslims. Because somebody like Shah Bano really understands that she's an Indian citizen and therefore she feels that she's entitled to the protection of the law of the land. On the other hand, she's a Muslim woman. Right? And so therefore Muslim organization, organizations are saying that she should not be entitled to the protection okay, of the Supreme Court here because in matters related to property rights, divorce, marriage, annulment, adoption, so forth and so on, in these matters, Muslim personal law shall prevail. Right? So this is essentially what is going to happen. Now the government is going to get extremely agitated. And this, is, this tells you what the fragile nature, nature of a secular democracy such as India can be, why does the government get agitated? Because when the All India Muslim Personal Board starts to intervene in this dispute, immediately the fear is that the Congress party okay, is going to lose the votes of all Muslims. They're going to lose a Muslim vote. I mean, this is where, where popular electoral democracy comes into place, that parties do certain kinds of things, 
the government and power does certain kind of things, not because of any inherent political or moral reason, but because of certain kinds of political calculations. So what did the government do? The government passed a piece of legislation. It passes a piece of legislation which says that the Supreme Court's verdict cannot be applied in a case like this, that Muslim personal law shall in fact actually prevail. Okay? And this is obviously taking the controversy to the next stage. And this is essentially the position that was adopted at the time of the Shah Mano case. It, this, by the way, drags through the courts for several years. So by the time you actually get the government making a decision of this kind, we're talking about the mid-1980s. Okay? And I'm, and I'm mentioning this because I'm saying to you that one way to look at it is to say, well, what about Shabano? Is Shabano simply now incidental to the argument, which is my position, that in fact, actually, by the time you got around to all of this legislation, the Supreme Court decision, it's very clear that nobody is interested in Shabano. Shabano is simply an index, if I may put it this way, of things to come. She is simply... If, I, if, if you had to put it in a yet a different way, she's simply the point around which different parties are going to articulate different kinds of positions. Right? And those positions have to do, for the most part, with certain kinds of political calculations, what is in the best interest of a political party, what is in the best interest of the government, and so on. Okay? Right? And I'm suggesting to you, of course, that these kinds of debates are not easily resolved in a secular democracy of this kind, one of the arguments that the, that the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, um, has made over the years is that they have insisted that there should be a common civil law in India as well. Right? And there are very strong positions on this. Uh, there are very strong positions on this because, of course, there are secular people and people like myself who would say, yeah, that makes absolute sense, you should do that. But on the other hand, the problem is that this argument for a common civil code is coming from the Hindu right party, right? So then you, then you have to wonder to what extent this common civil code would itself be tinged by a certain kind of Hindu ideology, right? And how will we determine what is a common civil code, right? I mean, because in order to determine a common civil code, some kind of common ground would have to be found between the different communities. So this is, I think, part of the difficulty that certainly when you're looking at, at criminal law, you could say that, yes, there's a common set of regulations that shall apply to everybody, common sets of definitions about what constitutes a crime. Uh, but when you come to matters pertaining to marriage, divorce, property rights, so forth and so on, there should be a different set of considerations. Okay? And that's essentially the status quo down to the present day, that you have a separate Muslim personal law, right? and then you have separate sets of personal laws for the Sikhs, Jews, you know, all other groups that you can think of, okay? Now, let me wrap up the discussion that I have about the position of women in Indian society with a few general observations, right? The two things that we have looked at, we have looked in some detail, that is, is we've looked at the question of dowry, uh, and in relationship to that, we looked at the question of what, uh, if the, uh, the phrase that I would use, which is a phrase that is used in the literature, uh, uh, dowry murder, okay? Uh, and the second issue that we've looked at today uh, is the issue of, uh, Muslim women, and particular through the issue, particularly through the this the lens given in, into this issue by the case of Shah Bano. Okay, but I think that there are some general sets of considerations, and in order to have these general considerations resonate with you in certain ways, uh, I want to remind you of the general history that I'd given of women, okay, in India. Uh, before we moved into the consideration of the dowry case. And I had made a number of observations. I want to refresh your memory about those observations. One was that one of the things that happened, okay, in the 1920s, uh, under Gandhi in particular, and under the Indian nationalist movement at that time, was the entry of women into the public sphere. Okay, the entry of women into the public sphere. Um, and what this meant was not simply that women were now moving around in the public sphere in certain ways. It also meant that certain issues related to women uh, are going to now become part of the agenda, the national agenda for reform. Okay? These issues had always been there, but perhaps a different kinds of issues. They had always been there in the 19th century, and this is where the second argument comes in, because recall that what I had said was that in the 19th century, the British came around to the view that you judge a civilization by how it treats its women. So they set up an evaluative scale. 
And the evaluative scale meant that India was going to be way down in that evaluative scale because the argument was that if you looked at sati, you looked at female infanticide, you looked at the fact that women and girls were not being educated, right? If you looked at all of these kinds of criteria, right, then it was very clear that India was a country that did not treat women and girls in the right way, right? That was the British view, okay? And I'm saying to you that, that in some ways that view still persists because Many of the issues having to do with social reform are issues that are particular to women and girls. Many. I mean, there are obviously larger issues having to do with hunger, for example, which affect not just women and girls, but could affect elderly people, for example, right? Because if you look at starvation and you look at what portions of the population are more uh, vulnerable to starvation, uh, you rapidly come to the conclusion that it's not just women and girls, but elderly people as well. Okay, they have less access to food. There's also the view that, well, these people are pretty much past their prime. They're going to pass away pretty soon. So when in a certain area you have a shortage of food, people who are vulnerable are going to include people who are elderly as well. Okay, and that has nothing to do necessarily with gender. But I'm saying in general, though, the view that you had in the 19th century has persisted down to the present. Okay, namely that, that you evaluate India largely by looking at the position of women, okay, and girls. Yes? That's right. Very good question. It goes to the civil laws. Yeah. Because, you, because at that point you cannot, de you cannot determine whether you're going to go strictly by Hindu law, unless there's a mutual consent from both parties. Okay, you can, go to, you can go to a case where there's mutual consent. So you've got a Hindu woman married to a Muslim male. Okay, and there's mutual consent that, that their differences will be adjudicated on the Hindu court. It can go to that, it can go to a Muslim court, or the default position would be it goes to the Supreme Court. Or it goes to the Supreme Court, it would be simply a stand-in for the regular courts of the country. It would go to a district court, high court, whatever the case might be. Yeah, that's the default position, okay? Yeah. All right, so in the observations that I want to end with now, keeping in mind what I've already said, I want to suggest to you one, that I think it would not be inaccurate to speak about what I'm going to call a women's movement in India, okay? Now, the question is how exactly does one define a women's movement? Uh, because, for example, if you looked at the United States today, uh, you know, would you say that there's a women's movement going on? Uh, because, for example, in the 1960s, you could certainly speak of a women's movement. No question about it, right? And the women's movement there had to do with such things as opening up the public sphere to women, uh, creating a new set of laws, uh, for example, about sexual harassment in the workplace. Because when women start moving into the workplace, in large numbers, obviously, the law has to become sensitive to the social changes that are taking place in that society, right? Uh, so these kinds of things have been occurring in India as well. I mean, laws pertaining to, for example, sexual harassment, I would say have been much slower off the ground in India than they have been over here, okay? Uh, it part, partly it has to do with the fact that, proportionately speaking, a smaller percentage of women, at least in urban areas, okay, are in the workforce. A smaller percentage in India compared to the United States. But as these percentages have grown, obviously the demand for new kinds of legislation has grown correspondingly, okay? But when I say women's movement, uh, for example, on the issue of dowry, you know, how did we really become aware of the whole issue of dowry murder and dowry crime? And I think largely it had to do with the, with the role played by uh, activists and feminists in urban areas, right? And if that is the case, then I think that you can certainly speak about something like a women's movement. Uh, if you look at, for example, the Narmada Bachao Andolan, what is the Narmada Bachao Andolan? Something I'm going to talk about later on uh, in, uh, next week. So this is uh, the Narmada. Narmada is the name of a river. Uh, I've actually mentioned it to you in a different context before, early on in this class. Uh, and if you remember Arundhati Roy's reading, you will remember that she talks about this particular movement. Narmada is the name of a river. Bachao Andolan, uh, Andolan means movement. Bachao means save. So save the Narmada movement, right? Uh, and you remember that what, what we're talking about here is that along the stretch of the Narmada and a number of its tributaries, there's been an attempt to build hundreds of dams, right? So there's a huge 
movement in opposition to this, its most visible public figure of this movement is a woman by the name of Meda Patkar. Right? And I think that if you look at ecological movements in particular, you're going to find women having played a very substantial role, a very substantial role in ecological movement. There are going to be certain spheres of public social activism, in other words, in which I think women are more prominent than in others, where it seems that livelihoods are impacted in some substantial sense of the term, I think you're going to see a greater involvement of women. And so that's why I think uh, the visibility of women and ecological movements in India, I think, has been quite considerable. And this is, of course, an interesting set of questions it raises. What is the degree of congruence between women's movements and ecological movements? Right? Okay, I mean, in some cases, they're obviously separate. In some cases, there's obviously a great deal of overlap that you find between the two. Right? But are these the only ways in which women enter into the public sphere or gain increasing rights? So let me give you an illustration, the last one really, uh, of what it would mean to have greater representation of women, greater presence of women in the public sphere. Uh, there is a bill that was passed in India a few years ago. Uh, it's called, it's the Panchayati Raj Bill. So Panchayati Raj refers to uh, uh, governance at the local level, okay? The word Panchayat, uh, some of you might recall this word before. Uh, I've used it in connection with my discussion of caste. So Panchayat is a local council, okay, from the word Panch, which means five. So it's a council technically, literally of five elders, of the village, but very often it's more than five, obviously, right? So Panchayati Raj is local governance at the village level, at the district level. Now, this bill that was passed stipulates that 33% of all the seats at the Panchayat level have to be filled by women, 33%. And of course, it raises all kinds of interesting questions. It raises interesting questions. If, for example, you are in a district in Rajasthan where the rate of literacy of women is 5%, which is true of some districts of Rajasthan. Okay? The rate of literacy for rural women in this district, let's say, is 5%, and yet you have a Panchayati Raj bill which says that 33% of the seats have to be filled by women. Right? Then we are saying a number of things. We are saying that there are going to be seats that are going to be filled by women who in fact, cannot read the documents that they're supposed to sign, right? Because at some point, local governance would also involve some amount of literacy, right? That's one possible conclusion. The second conclusion that you could reach is that, in fact, the Panchayati Raj bill may be more destructive than productive of social good because it will give an opportunity for men to put women into position who they will then try to control as puppets. Right? That's an argument that has been made very often. And some feminists say, well, frankly, we don't really care whether that's true or not, because if you put a woman into that position, and let's say she knows nothing, well, within two or three years, she may pick up things on the job. And people that you assume you can manipulate may not be so easily manipulable. Right? That's an argument that you might hear from the other side. And I'm simply indicating to you that the fact that you have a piece of legislation of this kind is, I think, a rather interesting argument, right? Because what it suggests here, in this case, is we're saying that it means that there's going to be some local representation, and these women who move into these positions are in the future going to be able to move into higher level of politics, national level of politics, and so on, right? So it's, it's something to consider. I mean, now they had, they had tried to stipulate, by the way, that 33% of the seats and the Lok Sabha, the Lok Sabha is the equivalent of the House of Representatives in the U.S., right, should be filled by women as well. That bill didn't pass. And one of the reasons that can't pass is because obviously at the Lok Sabha you're talking about much higher level of legislation. You're talking about obviously certain kinds of social networks that you need, political networks that you need. Uh, and, it, and it's not clear that there would be enough women, in fact, actually who would be able to be able to capitalize on these kinds of networks, right? Okay, so this is, I think, uh, where I want to really end my discussion. Um, there will be some further discussion about this when we actually move to a discussion of popular
uh, and public culture in India, because one of the things that we haven't really spoken about, but it's really more appropriate to speak about it uh, in the segment that's going to come now, uh, is how do we speak about the everyday life of women in the public sphere, the everyday life. Right, I've given you a little bit hint about that, because remember I mentioned to you an institution called the Pan Shop, right? This is a shop which sells beetle leaves and cigarettes and so on, tobacco, right? And I'd given it as an illustration of a kind of space uh, in the public realm, which is an exclusively masculine kind of space. Okay, so that would be an illustration of the kind of thing I talk about when I say that, well, yes, I mean, there may be women moving into the public sphere in big ways. There may be women who are moving into government jobs, into the professions, and yet there might be particular segments of that public space which are completely shut off to them. Not by any legislation, but simply by virtue of custom, habit, right, social pressure, so forth and so on. Okay, but we're going to leave that to that discussion to a slightly later period. Any questions before I move to the next segment? Any questions at all? Okay, let me begin by giving you a few general observations about the nature of the discussion that has taken place uh, in uh, Indian literature, scholarly literature, and otherwise about uh, the public and popular sphere in India. Okay. Uh, there are several ways to understand what we mean by the public and popular sphere. Uh, one is to obviously look at cinema. The other is to look at how communities get refashioned in public spaces. Okay. Uh, for example, a train journey in India. Is it the same as a train journey in every other part of the world? Now, if you've ever been on a second class Indian train and you've done one of these 35-hour, 40-hour train journeys, you would know it's a very, very different proposition. Okay, uh, All kinds of communities can be formed in the space of that 35, 40 hour journey. All kinds of social transactions are possible within the space of that journey. Okay, And so this is the sort of thing I mean when I say that when we speak about a public sphere in India, uh, we cannot, and popular sphere, we cannot be thinking only of uh, the cinema hall. Uh, we cannot be thinking only of the professions. We have to be thinking about a much larger array of considerations, okay? And I'm going to give you an illustration, uh, a dramatic illustration, because it will also be a way of getting into a discussion of Hindu, popular Hindi cinema. In 1975, there was a film that was made called Jai Santoshi Ma. Okay, if you go to my website, Manas, by the way, you'll find a discussion of that film uh, over there, all right? Jai Santoshi Ma. What is, Jai, uh, what is Santoshi Ma? Santoshi Ma is the name of a goddess. Okay. Now, she's not one of these goddesses that has existed uh, since time immemorial, okay? um, because uh, Indian uh, deities are very different than deities in any other religion. They can, born, they can be born and they can die, if I may put it this way. Okay? At least some of the non-major ones can. Right? Now, Santoshi Ma is a goddess. Um, who's uh, uh, if, uh, 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 a goddess who in the late 19th century had virtually no following at all. In other words, she's virtually unknown. In the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century, in the last 50, 60 years, she has become an immensely popular goddess. Um, I once had a graduate student here at this university, an Indian woman, who was a devotee okay, uh, of Santoshi Ma, which meant that she kept Santoshi Ma's fast because all of the gods and goddesses, there are days of fasting associated with them. right? So if you're a follower of such and such god, you keep a fast on such and such day. Right? Uh, the Santoshi Ma fast is kept on a Friday. Okay? Right? So, she, so, so every Friday was a fast for her, a fasting day. And this goddess um, is a goddess that, as I said, has become popular only in the last five or six decades. One of the things that made popular, made her popular is the film. Okay? So here it's a reverse case. You assume that there's a goddess that's immensely popular and then somebody is going to come along and make a film and he's going to capture that popularity. In fact, it's the other way around here. Because yes, she was well known by the second half of the 20th century. She was relatively well known, but she had nothing like the kind of following that she was going to have after 1975. When this film comes out, 
And when this film comes out, suddenly the number of devotees of Santoshi Ma start to multiply hugely. Okay? Uh, now, there are ethnographic reports of cinema halls where this film was being shown, where before people went into that cinema hall, they took off their shoes. Why would you do that? Anybody want to make a guess? Yeah. Exactly. It's the transformation of the cinema hall into a temple. Right? Because when you go into a Hindu temple, you take off your shoes. And so there are cinema halls where this film was being shown. And before people walked into it, they would politely take off their shoes. OK? Now, you cannot understand a cinema hall the same way in India as you understand it here. That's what I'm suggesting to you, that the space of the cinema hall is not the same space that you are used to from watching films over here. So for example, there's this whole protocol in America about how you watch a film, if I may put it this way. You know, you know, everybody has to be pretty much quiet. And if somebody next to you is whispering you know, a little too much, then you eventually tell them to shut up. In India, it is considered quite common that you go on talking. And now what that means that you keep on getting cell, cell phone calls on your cell phone while the film is going on. And if you try to tell the guy next door that he should shut off his cell phone, it's not going to rub off very well, necessarily. Maybe in an elite cinema hall in, in Delhi, it may be OK. But you go to a, a you know, non-elite cinema hall, you go to the rural area, and you tell people that you have to be absolutely quiet while you're watching a film. It's not something that leaves a great impression on them, if I may put it this way. Okay? So the culture of the cinema hall is very different. Right? And so when you start looking at Hindi films, we're saying it's not simply what's in the film that is important, okay? how a film is structured, right? who is the cast in it, all of these are important considerations. There is a culture of the cinema hall as well. And one of the interesting questions that's gonna, that has come up in the study of Indian cinema is that at least in the large metropolitan centers, you now have these multiplexes, right, that have come in, right? So one cinema hall that's now been fragmented into six screens, just like you have over here, right? Well, how does that really change the nature of the cinema-going experience? Does it change the nature of the experience you have at the cinema, All right? Now, leave that question aside for a second. Let's come to, first, an understanding of how one understands different forms of culture. Okay, because we're going to be looking at the Hindi film. And before we look at the Hindi film, I want to, you to turn your attention to this fourfold distinction that I made over here, okay, between classical, mass, popular, and folk. Before we turn to India, let me suggest to you that in the US, okay, essentially you have two forms of culture. And somebody here might strongly disagree, well and good, if you do. But I would suggest to you that there are essentially two forms of culture in the US. One is what you might describe as classical culture or high culture. And the other is what you might describe as popular culture. OK? Um, and mass and popular culture are not the same. So the first thing we have to understand is what is the exact distinction between mass culture and popular culture. Folk culture only exists here, if I may put it this way, in America as a museum piece. Okay, as a museum piece, right? So folk culture would mean uh, a Romanian American, for example, right, uh, who's been here for four generations doing Romanian dances that nobody does in Romania anymore, that they haven't done there for 60 years and they're still doing them over here, okay? And it's like Indian Americans too. Uh, you know, if you go to the, uh, the annual culture show that they have, the student culture show here, uh, that they have here, uh, it's fascinating because they're doing things that nobody in India is doing anymore. I mean, it's like 40 years ago, the idea of what constitutes, and that has now become, if I may put it this way, folk culture. So folk culture is something that you basically, if I may put it this way, display to tourists as a museum piece. Okay? It has no intrinsic relationship, life relationship to that culture in the United States, in the U.S. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. Okay? I'm talking about the U.S. What is the distinction between mass and popular culture? Is there a distinction? How would you make that distinction? Does anybody want to give, venture into that? Do you see a distinction at all between the two, mass and popular? Natalie. 
Okay, so what would be an illustration of mass culture, let's say, in America? High school musical, movie series. And, okay, high school musical, which, by the way, since I have a young daughter, I do know about. Otherwise, I would have known nothing about it. Uh, but, uh, yes, I, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, unfortunately seen that film far too many times. Um, okay, so high school musical would be an example of mass culture. So, shall we say really lowbrow? Is that what you mean, in part? Maybe not the most polite thing to say, but really lowbrow, huh? Okay, and, what, uh, and how would you distinguish that between, between that and popular culture? So what would be an instance of popular culture that is not mass culture? <coughs> Any, anybody? Any idea? Okay, let me rephrase the question. When does mass culture come into existence, historically speaking? In other words, has there always been mass culture, or is this something that is relatively recent in human history? Recent. Okay, and if so, why? And can you spell it out, maybe? Um, no. <laughs> well, I was thinking that maybe in the 60s, uh, mass culture became more apparent. Okay. Everyone started buying the same cars and TVs. And okay, so what happened in the 1950s? Okay, media, television, media, right? Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about over here. For those of you who know South Asia, you know that there is a very popular form of culture called kite flying. You fly kites if you're in the big cities. That's, by the way, slowly diminishing, slowly diminishing. I mean, so, I mean, Delhi in the summer when I was growing up, every evening, on the rooftops, you'd go and you'd just fly kites, and that's what you would do, okay? And then you would cut each other's kites if you could. I mean, fabulous competitions, you know, okay? And you would do that. That is popular culture. It's not mass culture, and it's not mass culture because mass is a category that only comes in with the wide dissemination of that culture from the top, if I may put it this way. In other words, you cannot really have mass culture in the 15th century, for example. You don't have a print media. And even when you have a print media, when printing comes into place, I mean, the first texts that are going to be printed and are going to be distributed in the West, it's the Bible, for example. But you're not talking about hundreds and millions of copies. You're talking still about a very small number. You always had popular culture. So the popular culture would mean, if you were living in 10th century Europe, it would mean going to the annual fair, going to the pilgrimage of such and such saint. That is popular culture. Because it's being engaged in by a large number of people, but it does not have a technical means of dissemination. And that dissemination is not coming from the top. Okay, That's the distinction between mass culture and popular culture. Essentially. Yes? Can you elaborate a little bit what you mean by dissemination? For example, television. What television does is it basically makes all popular culture into mass culture. Okay? Radio, satellite television, cable television, DVDs, all of that are moving us increasingly and increasingly into what you would call mass culture. Mass culture and popular culture, in other words, in the U.S., are completely congruent. Okay? There's no separate space. Now, in India, there is a separate space, because this would be an illustration. Kite flying is what you would describe as popular culture. It's not mass culture. Mass culture would be Hindi cinema. That's mass culture. Okay? You know, playing with marbles, one of the other things you did when you grew up, particularly boys, it was considered not quite proper for girls to do that, right? But one part of popular culture was you go out in front of your house and you play with marbles, marble games, okay? And marble games also led to more fights. That was one reason why girls didn't move into it as much as boys, okay? Right? That is what you would describe as popular culture. Cricket in India is a very interesting illustration of something that is now becoming mass culture. And it's become mass culture, not simply it was popular culture, it was played by wide, widely, but it still did not have the kind 
of market, the kind of appeal that it has had in the last 10 years after, in fact, actually television started introducing it in a dramatic way into every Indian household. Okay, and mass culture also, by the way, has a monetary aspect to it, if I may put it this way. The monetization of culture leads to mass culture. It's not simply the technical aspect of it, the mass dissemination of it coming from top. Mass culture always has some aspect of monetization related to it. High School Musical would be a very good example. I mean, I've, I've heard that the guy who's, you know, the, the young people who act in it, they all now got huge mansions, apparently, you know. Okay? This is monetization. You did not get, you know, huge mansions from becoming the best kite player in India. Okay? So you, I hope you're seeing the distinction. That what we're saying is that, okay, if you're going to look at culture in India, let us first understand that, because we're going to have to see what are the different elements that go into the composition of the Hindi film. Okay? So we all understand what classical music means, right? Or classical culture means. And so in America, classical culture, the highest of the classical culture would be opera. Okay? And then just a shade below that would be, you know, instrumental music, if I may put it this way. Okay? Right? Okay? But that would be classical music would be obviously classical culture. Okay? Now, in India, classical culture would include classical in music, both of North India and South India, which are two completely distinct systems, by the way, right? But nonetheless, classical music would be a, would be a, comp a component of classical culture, although we are going to see that many of the popular tunes that you find in Hindi films are actually based on classical compositions. They're actually based on classical composition. So the classical composition is called a rag, okay? Just so that you know, you're not going to get a full lecture on Indian aesthetics here, but basically the classical composition is called a rag, okay? And a rag is known by two distinctive things. Number one, rags are intended for different times of the day. So if you go listen to a great sitar player at 9 o'clock in the evening, he will play for you a late evening rag. Okay? Because all rags create a certain kind of mood. At 9 o'clock in the evening, you're in the mood for something like drinking wine, maybe. Okay? And at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're in the mood for something quite different. Right? So in the morning, he will play a early morning rag. I mean, I remember going to a, a concert by Kishori Amonkar at 6 o'clock in the morning, which meant you had to get up at 4, because if you wanted to listen to an early morning rag, you had to do that, because she will only play an early morning rag at 6 in the morning. She's not going to play it at 12 in the afternoon. Okay? That's rule number one of a classical composition. The second rule, if I may put it this way, is that all rags have a dominant mood. Okay? A dominant as mood, a dominant aesthetics. Okay? So, for example, a rag creates envy in you, or it creates the sentiments of love in you, or the sentiments of anger in you. Okay? So, this is what I mean. A dominant mood, so love is shringar, for example. Anger is crote. So this is the particular feature of this, and that is one reason why I'm suggesting to you. See, you have to keep in mind what the argument here is. That I'm saying, okay, in the West, in the US in particular, we're saying there's category one here, classical, okay? And then there's this category called mass culture, okay? There is no such thing as folk culture, for reasons I've already told you, except as museum pieces, okay? Strictly as museum pieces. So, you know, if you want the folk culture of the American Indian, you know, right, then you go to the American Indian Museum and maybe they'll have a little, you know, dance for you at 12 o'clock, you know, right? Okay, that's folk art. That's all that exists, really. In India, of course, it's very different. The reason it's very different is because there are large parts of the rural landscape in particular, which have not yet come under mass culture or under classical culture at all. Okay? An instance of this would be, for example, uh, something like Ganjifa, which are these cards, which are hand-painted. 
and you play with these cards in villages in Maharashtra. Okay, that's all. They don't have a white currency. Nobody in Delhi would have any idea what that culture is. None whatsoever. Okay, so now we're saying if you look at what constitutes classical culture, what I'm saying to you is the categories in India are much more elastic because if you watch a popular Hindi film, okay, which is also in this case an aspect of mass culture, okay, if you watch a popular Hindi film and you listen to a tune on it, you would not necessarily know that the tune is actually based on a composition which comes from classical culture. And that can happen, by the way, in the West too. I mean, there are popular, very popular films where a little segment of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or the Eroica Symphony, right, has been put into it, right? In fact, there's this film, really stupid film that my kids used to watch a lot about this dog called Beethoven, right? Okay, and so there's Beethoven's music in it, right? And this is an instance of where you've got this music, okay, that is clearly based on a classical composition, right? And, but, but, but there is just too evident. I mean, what's interesting about the Hindi film music is that it's not really evident at all unless you know how the rag composition actually works, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind, all right? Now, let's move to the next stage of the discussion about Hindi cinema. Before we do that, I want to tell you that there are multiple cinemas in India, multiple cinemas. And when I say multiple here, I do not mean multiple in the way in which that phrase might be used to describe American cinema, because there is an underground American cinema. There always has been, okay? Uh, so there's Hollywood, there's the big productions, Universal Studios kind of thing, you know, 20th Century Fox, right? That's the well-known Hollywood productions, and then there's always been an underground American cinema. That's not what I'm referring to, because you get that in India too. And that's, when you get to cinema, you make a distinction in India between what is called popular cinema or mainstream cinema, and then what is called art cinema, okay? So the art cinemas are, are films that have no songs, uh, will usually put the average viewer to sleep within 20 minutes. Uh, they're always about the great social problems of India, which everybody knows about, but nobody wants to really see in a film. Okay, such as the exploitation of women, you know, the uh, uh, grinding poverty of everyday life, right? That's art cinema. Those are the kinds of films that win all the awards at the film festivals, uh, and yet it's virtually impossible to see any of these films in India, okay? Now, they're really, I mean, some people have argued that these films are really made for the overseas market, almost, okay? I'm not prepared to go that far at all, uh, because I think it underestimates the extent to which, at least in regional areas, these so-called art cinemas actually can have quite a considerable impact. So when I say multiple cinemas, I'm talking about films made in different languages. And one of, the, one of the things that is often said about Indian cinema, it's almost a cliche, and it's completely false in this case, namely that Indian cinema is Hindi cinema, and it's the largest cinema in the world. Well, actually, that's entirely incorrect, because the cinema of South India, if you put Telugu, Kannada, Tamil, Films together, it's larger than the number of films made in Hindi. Okay? And it has a very substantial market, and it has had a global market. Now, that's very, very surprising to most people. Why has it had a global market? Because if you're making a film in Tamil, the kind of country where you could see that film would be Sri Lanka, Malaysia, right? And so on, because these are all countries which have substantial Indian Tamil populations, right? So we're talking about multiple cinemas in India, and I want to add that when I make remarks today, the rest of the lecture today, and on Thursday about popular Hindi cinema, I'm really speaking about mainstream Hindi cinema, okay? And I'm speaking about mainstream Hindi cinema not only because Hindi is a language I know best here, right, but also because unquestionably, it is the cinema that has now the largest global reach of any Indian cinema, okay? It is a diaspora kind of cinema. One interesting question that I'm not going to resolve, I'm just going to lay it before you for your information, is that you could argue that in the last 15 years, there's been a significant shift in the Hindi film, and that shift has to do with the fact that filmmakers back in India, 
are much more conscious of the fact that there is a large diasporic market okay, for the Hindi film outside India. So I would suggest to you, in fact, that some of the films that are now being made are being made at least in part with an eye to the diasporic population. Yes? Would you say that the classical culture is withering away in, 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 in cinema? Because I mean... That's in cinema or in general? Uh, I mean in cinema. No, no, I wouldn't say that at all. No, in fact, actually, if you look at, let's say, I mean, okay, now I have to get into films, but there's a film that was made several years ago, Hindi film, um, that became really well known in the U.S. too, called Lagan. Okay, so if you look at the, f the, the f songs of Lagan, and if you look at the tunes, they are very much based in classical culture. And that film is not that old. It goes back to about 2002 or 2003, somewhere around that time. Okay, so I, I wouldn't say it has it has disappeared. There have been significant shifts. One of the most significant shifts that has taken place, other than the one I've already mentioned to you, which is about the diaspora, is the fact that Urdu is much less frequently heard in the common Hindi film today than it was 30 years ago. The declining significance of Urdu is an important factor. And looking at Hindi cinema. Yes? No, no, okay. So Urdu is, okay, you basically, this is, the, this is the split and the continuum that you would have to know. Okay, so you've got Urdu, you've got Hindustani, and you've got Hindi. All right? Now, when we say Hindi language cinema, Hindi is being used as a generic word, okay? Because this Hindi can have a very high component of words which are Arabic slash Persian in origin. Okay, so if you, good, if you look at the history of Hindi cinema, you will find after the partition of India in 1947, a very significant percentage of the songwriters Okay, the dialogue writers, well, dialogue writers is not quite the word because most Hindi films, if I may put it this way, well, I should, dialogue writers would be okay, but not script writers, that they don't usually have a written script that they go on. The script is basically improvised on the sets, unlike a, a Hollywood film where you have a script long beforehand. Okay, but the people who write the songs, the people who write the script, and people who were involved in the production of cinema in general, in various capacities, a significant percentage of these people were Muslims. Significant percentage, okay? So that's something you'd have to keep in mind. Now, what is the relationship of these three and that, and what is the relationship to Muslims, okay? So if you go to Pakistan, like for example, if I went to Pakistan today, okay, and I'm speaking about the Punjab portion of Pakistan, I can understand 90% of the conversation that is taking place as a Hindi speaker. Why? Because the Hindi that I speak in India is the actual proper term for that is Hindustani. Okay? This is the word Hindustani. That's the proper term for it. We just call it Hindi just for the sake of convenience, out of habit. It's a generic category. Okay? So Hindustani is the common language spoken in North India and in Pakistan. The difference is the following. That if you Sanskritize the Hindustani. What does it mean to Sanskritize the Hindustani? You take out some of the Arabic slash Persian words and you use words that are more Sanskrit based. Then you end up with Hindi. If on the other hand, and this is what they're going to do in Pakistan, right? So it's a reverse of what they do in India. In India what they do is they Sanskritize the Hindustani so it becomes more like Hindi which means it's more Sanskrit based. In Pakistan, what they do is they desanskritize it, all right? Or if I may put it this way, they will they will use a more they will use words with more of an Arabic slash Persian content to it, okay? And and this is why I'm saying there's a 90% overlap. This 90% overlap, by the way, might come down to 70% because if you watch Pakistan television, right? If you watch the official news from Pakistan, heavily heavily into Arabic Persian. Right? So for a, for a Sanskrit slash Hindi speaker, it's hard to follow it.
Okay, so you understand what I'm saying, right? Now, the, when you had Muslims in the Hindi film industry in a rather big way, okay, and their numbers have gone down, the Urdu content of Hindi film has gone down. Means precisely this, that what we are saying is that the Hindi film is truly becoming a more of a Hindi film. In other words, it's not just Hindustani now, we're talking about words that are being used which really have a base in Sanskrit rather than a base in Arabic. Okay, that's one very significant shift that has taken place in the Hindi film, in the popular Hindi film, and over the course of the last four or five decades. And the second one that I mentioned to you about is the fact that Hindi film is increasingly sensitive to something that you might call the diaspora. Okay, now, does one talk about Hindi film the same way that one talks about, if you leave aside these considerations, the way that one talks about cinema in the West. So one of the major things that, that uh, theorists of cinema have done in the West is they have basically looked at what are called genres. Okay? So for example, one genre that used to be very common in American cinema and that has largely disappeared, anybody? Western. The Western. Okay? That's a specific genre. Okay? Right? It's a specific genre. You also have the screwball comedy, as it used to be called. For those of you interested in cinema, you would know there's a specific genre called the screwball comedy. Then there's a science fiction genre. If you ask me, the Hindi film has one predominant genre. Right? So therefore, the word genre doesn't really make any sense because there are not, there are not like several genres to distinguish from. And that is what I am going to call the social slash romantic film. Okay, generally speaking, there used to be a genre called the mythological. So this film that I mentioned to you, Jai Santoshi Ma, made in 1975, was a mythological. It dealt with material that was strictly mythological, dealt with, in this case, the life of a goddess, almost. Okay, right? But that genre has more or less disappeared, more or less disappeared. There was also a genre, if you want to put it this way, uh, it was called, and it was very common in the 1950s, 1960s, up till about, I would say, the mid-1970s. That genre was called the social Muslim. In other words, this was a Hindi film which dealt with some of the dilemmas of being a Muslim in Indian society. Okay? And it has virtually disappeared, virtually disappeared. Okay, so what you have now is you have this kind of, and you could say that there are subgenres even today. So for those of you interested in Hindi cinema, you would know that the number of films uh, about terrorism has increased dramatically over the last 10 to 12 years. And you could say, well, it doesn't really fit in this social slash romantic genre that I'm really talking about. Okay, and yes, there are obviously going to be exceptions here. Okay, so this would be one kind of film which really does not quite fit into the social slash romantic kind of, you know, dominant Hindi film that you have. Okay, uh, but in general, it would be difficult to speak about a genre of films on terrorism. It's not a specific genre. Okay, so yes, there are different strands that have emerged in popular Hindi cinema, right? But I'm saying to you that notwithstanding the fact that there are these different strands, and one strand has to do with the nation state and problems of terrorism, right, that the dominant mood of the Hindi film is the social slash romantic. One way to judge it, by the way, is to look at the titles of these films. I cannot tell you how many Hindi films have been made in the last 10 years with the word Dil. Dil means heart, okay? Dil, to pagal hai. You know, the Dil is crazy. Dil se, from the heart. Dil wale dulaniya le jayenge. You know, the brave hearted will carry the girl away. Right? I mean, it's endless. Right? If you are stuck for a title in Hindi cinema, just put in Dil somewhere in there, and you basically got your formula. Okay? And much more common in the last 10, 15 years than it used to be in the 60s, 70s. Okay? So, the question of genres. I mean, all of this is essential because... You have to be certain that when you watch a Hindi film, you don't see it through the template of a film made here. From your understanding of what constitutes American cinema or Western cinema, we're talking about a very different world. Which leads me to my next comment, that 
I think one of the reasons why the Hindi film remains extraordinarily attractive, okay, I'll begin with the simplest reason, and then I'll move to the much more complex reason. And for that, we'll have to really see segments of Divar, with which we're going to do that on Thursday. Right? But the simplest reason for why the Hindi film remains attractive is that in a highly cynical world, where all of us, or at least all of us who are beyond 25 at least, have become highly jaded about such things such as romantic love and so on, that the Hindi film retains a space for this kind of romantic love, which I think has largely disappeared from cinema. And somebody might here say, oh, you know, I mean, isn't all of Hollywood about that in some ways? Yeah, but Hollywood is not just about romantic love. It's always about romantic love plus sex, romantic love plus something else, okay? The Hindi film has, if I may put it this way, a kind of a pure space, still. Right? It's still, you know, about two bleeding hearts, boy and girl, somehow, you know, and you, they don't have to be dancing around a tree or something like that. If they are well and good, then you certainly know what they're doing, right? <laughs> I'm saying that there is a kind of a space for an idea that has disappeared from popular culture elsewhere in the world, at least in the dominant West. Okay? So, because we're trying to understand what actually makes the cinema tick, right? Because if you frankly see a Hindi film, I mean, I would say for at least half of the films, I mean, the plot is chicken feed. I mean, it's almost embarrassing <laughs> because, you know, you'd really have to be a fourth grader to sit through one of those films, seriously, and not really think that you've entered into a demented world. I mean, some of the dialogues are so pathetic, it's amazing how anybody could actually come out with these kinds of dialogues, right? right? So then you have to say, well, if that's the case, then is there some kind of thing that is going on in the Hindi film that's making it tick? And so I've started off with the simplest explanation, and the simplest explanation is that it actually creates a space for a certain kind of mood that a cynical world has largely dispensed with in its other cinemas, okay? Now we get to the much more complex reason. I want to suggest to you, and this argument will make a lot more sense, and I want to say it now so that you can start, if you haven't seen Divar, or if you have, you go back to it, that you start seeing this film in a slightly different way, okay? I want to suggest to you that the Hindi film is profoundly not interested in the question of history. It is interested largely in the world of myth. Now, if I say that, it might also explain why the mythological has disappeared, because the mythological was a special category or special genre of Hindi film devoted entirely to the myth, to the mythical world. And I'm saying that the mythical world is so diffused, so highly prevalent in Indian society that you don't actually need a genre to deal with it. It is present in every film that you can take, every film, with the possible exception of some of these new kinds of films about the nation state and terrorism and so on, okay? So what does it mean to say that this is a world that deals largely in the world of myth? There's a director, his name is Manmohan Desai, um, a little before your time, in fact actually died about 20 years ago, and he used to make these films, uh, 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 you know, these uh, Bollywood blockbusters, okay? Uh, so he made a film called Amar Akbar Anthony, okay? Uh, think of the name, by the way, Amar, Hindu name, Akbar, Muslim name, Krish Anthony, Christian name, so you can imagine that in part the film was about a plea for some kind of national unity, secularism, all of that, right? Okay? In, in part. So he made films like Amar Akbar Anthony, he made a film called Kuli, and so on. And shortly before he died, he actually committed suicide. Uh, shortly before he died, he was interviewed by a journalist working for a magazine called Stardust. Okay, if you really want to waste time, read Stardust. <laughs> if you really want to waste time, okay? I mean, you know, it's all about the stars and their lifestyles and so on, right? 
Okay? So uh, Stardust had an interview with Manmohan Desai, and Manmohan Desai was asked, uh, what are your films all about? And he gave the most astonishing reply, and in my view, the most interesting reply that I, I would never have dreamt it, that he would say something like that. He said, all my films are about the Mahabharat. Okay? Are about the Mahabharat. So what is a Mahabharat? It's an Indian epic. And you know what happens? So let me tell you the story of the Mahabharat now. Right? You see, it's impossible. If you're doing a Hindi film, it, it, one thing leads to another. So what is the Mahabharat about? Very briefly, you're not going to get a huge, um, because the epic is, you know, 200,000 lines of poetry. Okay, 200,000 lines of poetry. So what is the Mahabharat? So you have a group of people called the Kauravs, and you have a group of people called the Pandavs. The Pandavs are 100 in number. They're all brothers. Let's not get into technicalities here. Okay, you know, all 100 brothers, right? Okay, uh, and they're, uh, uh, sorry, Pandavs are five, and the Kauravs are 100. Okay, uh, so you've got five brothers and 100 on this side, and they are related to each other. They're first cousins. And they enter into a conflict, which is what brothers often do, um, especially in India, usually over property. If you read Indian newspapers or talk to middle class families, there are always disputes going on about property. Okay? This is the mega dispute over property. That's why it's called the Mahabharat. Maha means great. Okay? So to cut the story down to its essentials, its absolute essentials, the, the Kauravs, are not as well liked, if I may put it this way, as the Pandavs. So the Pandavs have five brothers. Their oldest brother, I'm just going to put his initial, his name is Yudhishthar. Well, he's, he is uh, the oldest of the brothers. And uh, another brother uh, who's quite important is a man called Arjun. And Arjun is the warrior. I mean, they're all warriors because they are Kshatriyas, right? That's their caste. If you said, what is your caste? The Kshatriyas. And what is the business of Kshatriyas? It's either to govern or to fight. Right? But Arjun is particularly the grand warrior. He's an archer. Okay? And uh, the Kauravs uh, lust for the property of the Pandas. Because it's very clear that Yudhishthira is going to become the, the, the king of the entire kingdom. And the Kauravs are led by two persons, Duryodhan and Dushashan. Okay, I mean, these are, uh, you know, if you knew Sanskrit, you'd just giggle at the names because the names are gi give away because Duryodhan literally means the evil one. Okay, I mean, okay. Right, so uh, uh, you've, got, you, you've got this two groups and they're going to actually get into a conflict and this conflict will involve all of India. That's why it's called the Mahabharat, right? It's, it, it, it's like this kind of uh, uh, bush scenario. You're, not, you're either with us or you're against us, if I may put it this way. All right? Now, Divar, you have noticed, for those of you who've seen it, it's two brothers. Okay? And one is, of course, the good guy, the other is the bad guy. It's not as simple as that, because we know that the bad guy is really, frankly, good. Right? But at least outwardly, Amitabh, okay, now we can start talking about the film. Amitabh is the one who's going to Amitabh Bachchan, here I'm using the actor's name now, okay? Uh, he is the one who is going to become the smuggler. His brother, who is played by Shashi Kapoor, is going to become the cop, okay? Insufferably boring in comparison to Amitabh Bachchan. And let me make one comment, and I'll end there because we're running over time. You will not find in the Hindi film a schizophrenic character ever. Almost never. Why? The reason for that is that, because what is a schizophrenic character, by the way? Who's got, somebody who's got two selves, a split personality. What they do in Hollywood is, if you want to project a split personality, you make the person schizophrenic. What the Hindi film does is it projects this split outwardly. It spits it out in two different characters. Okay? In other words, you're going to now have to see whether these two characters are really fundamentally two characters or whether, in fact, it is the fight within everyone between the good and the bad. Okay? That's 
that's what I'm suggesting to you, that when you look at the double in the Hindi film, the double in the Hindi film has a very different meaning. Because the double is the outward projection of the split within you. Okay? So I'm going to leave it at that. Go watch the film. I mean, this is just one small element here, and we're going to pick up the narrative on Thursday.